we we have Jai Raj Gopalakrishnan, okay, giving us the next presentation, and he is he is an exemplar of what we mean by a a joint uh, intern between Maastricht University and FinTrust. Thank you so Jai much. Raj, the floor floor is yours. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much, Professor, for that introduction. Uh, good morning, or good evening, or good afternoon, wherever from wherever you are today. Uh, my presentation today is actually going to be focusing on a small research project that we conducted at Finn uh, on the role of desalination for water security. And I want to share a few preliminary findings that we've gotten uh, from the case studies that we've conducted. So the first real question is, why do we want to study this? And Right now, uh, desalination is an evo ever-evolving topic, and over the years or over the past decade, there's been an increased adoption of desalination uh, globally. And the Middle Eastern region uh, are one of the earliest adopters, but you can see that in the rest of the world, uh, adoption of desalination technologies has been increasing, and people forecast it to continue increasing over the next few years as well. Uh, Right now, there are about there are more than 21,000 desalination plants spread across more than 120 countries worldwide, uh, and about 53% of these desalination plants are located in the Middle East. In the Middle East, because they were earlier uh, they were early adopters, they actually stuck to one of the earliest forms of desalination, which is thermal desalination. But as the technologies have improved we can see that uh, they've started adopting more membrane-based desalination technologies like reverse osmosis. So what were our research questions? What do we want to find out? First, what are the different types of technologies that are available to people right now? And what are the different efficiency conditions for each of them? Where are they cost efficient? Where does it make sense not to invest for them? Next, we want to look, we want to look at a few of the earlier adopters of desalination and see what can we learn from their experience. And finally, our nexus is India. So we wanted to see whether one, does desalination, does India really need desalination to address their water crisis right now? And two, how can they go about it? To conduct this study, we first went through an extensive literature review, going through government documents, journals, academic papers, and many of the like. From this entire repository of data we collected, we created case studies of the countries that we wanted to focus on. And the last step is today, the World Water Day event, where we've invited multiple speakers and experts in the field uh, from different disciplines to see what did they think about desalination and how did they see it's gonna evolve in the future. So the agenda for today is first, a quick definition of what desalination actually is the different technologies that we explored, a few snapshots and key initiatives that each country has taken, and our final takeaways. So what is desalination? Put very simply, it's just extracting the salt from the water so that, it's, so that it can be used for human consumption. It's the process of removing salts and other contaminants from seawater, brackish water, different sources of feed water. The different types of technologies, we've only explored three, and because it's constantly evolving, there are more coming out every day. But these are the three main desalination technologies that exist worldwide. First, it's thermal desalination. Thermal desalination is a very, very simple concept. It's things that we've done in our fifth and sixth grade science classes as well. It's you're heating up water to evaporate, and then you condense it so that the salt is left aside and you can use drinking water. It's one of the oldest forms of desalination. And thus, while it's evolving as well, it does end up being quite expensive. Membrane desalination is essentially the use of a semi-permeable material to filter out the contaminants from the feed water. This is the most common form of desalination present today. And it's there in almost every country in the world. And finally, charge-based desalination. This is a little more complicated, but it's essentially using the principles of attraction and repulsion to remove positively charged sodium components and negatively charged chloride components and NaCl is salt. 
With this, we just want to see what are the different efficiency conditions. This is more of a generalization because all of these technologies are modular. So they can be changed to different conditions and they can be adapted to different conditions. But today, generally, thermal desalination is the most commonly found for very large desalination plants since they're extremely efficient for high levels of salinity. It, they have high capital costs, but the maintenance costs fall lower. And because of the high level of salinity of the water that they're dealing with, it has a very high energy requirement. So it makes sense for thermal desalination plants to be in coastal areas and the feed water to be seawater, extremely saline water. Membrane desalination, on the other hand, is the most flexible form of desalination. It can be small, it can be big. It is genuinely the most adaptable form that you can use wherever you want. It's efficient for all levels of salinity and the maintenance cost depends on the feed water that you, that you provide. Because the material that you, the frequency with which you uh, replace the material depends on how frequently it's used and depends on whether the water is extremely saline or is it just brackish. And as compared to thermal desalination, it's extremely energy efficient. Finally, charge-based desalination. Charge-based desalination is ideal for small inland portable water, not to provide for a city, but more like to provide for maybe a village. It has low energy requirements and low capital and maintenance costs, and it's very, very efficient for small scale desalination. Now we look at the different countries that we've explored. We looked at Australia, Singapore, uh, Israel, and UAE. But in UAE, we focus down more on Dubai specifically. So Australia, why did they need something like desalination? Australia's challenge was during the late 90s and early 2000s, they had a major water crisis and this demanded quick coordination between multiple stakeholders. The government facilitated this and ensured proper, to ensure proper water provision, portable recycling and investments in desalination. They passed multiple policies incentivizing different forms to try to deal with the water problem that they had at hand. Stuff like exploration of water conservation, recycling, and gray water use. And at the end of it, they tried to develop a portfolio of water resources uh, to ensure that some are independent of climate and weather, so that at the end of it, if even in the case of a natural disaster, they would be able to provide this basic necessity. We have Dr. Meenakshi Arora as well from the University of Melbourne, and she'll be providing a few more insights onto the Australian experience. Singapore, like the other countries on this list, Singapore's challenge was the fact that they didn't have natural sources of water. They had rainfall, but it wasn't enough to provide for the population. Even at the time of independence, they had a contract set up with Malaysia to import their water for about a decade. During that time, they, reacted proactive, they worked proactively to set up a centralized water authority system called the Public Utilities Board. And they passed multiple policies ensuring proper focus on reuse and improving catchment areas for rain. And finally, they incentivized heavy innovations, which turned out with something called new water. Now, new water isn't a traditional innovation as a technological innovation, but it is an engagement innovation. Essentially, they saw that a lot of the people who are trying to use reused and recycled water for industrial or agricultural purposes were uncomfortable using recycled water. So a simple rebranding of the name essentially pumped up its adoption rate. So the people started becoming more comfortable just because you call it new water. And that's the power of engagement that people can use, that policy can use. Then Israel, again, Israel also went through multiple droughts through the 50s, 60s and 70s. And they also followed suit in trying to set up a centralized governing agency for water called the Israeli Water Authority. Their main focus wasn't just trying to provide water, but it was trying to set up a complete sustainable water management system. And they focused on initiatives like demand management and use of pricing for it, reuse of treated wastewater, investment in large-scale desalination. And finally, we come to the UAE. The UAE, like uh, Israel, in the MENA region, an extremely arid region with no natural resources of groundwater. Uh, like a lot of the other countries in, in this list, 
they set up each emirate set up its own water authority for example for dubai that, that is diwa dubai electricity and water authority for something like sharjah it would be siwa and they incentivize and uh funded multiple projects to explore alternative solutions to their water problem while they invested a lot in desalination as well them incentivizing this exploration came up with something called cloud seeding and cloud seeding essentially cloud seeding is done every year in dubai now and it essentially rejuvenates the surface and groundwater resources now we come back to india we come back to the crux of the problem india is facing one of the world's worst natural water crises there are more than 200000 people who die every year just because of lack of water lack of provision of clean water and for a long time the government does has recognized the problem and has tried to incentivize some solutions especially something like desalination they recognize the value of desalination as given by the national desalination mission that was approved in 2017 however while there are a lot of uh these are like missions and initiatives taken up the issue here is that the results of any studies or the results of any initiatives taken up are not in public domain so any other stakeholders or researchers like ourselves who want to see what the government has actually done it becomes quite the task to find out the government claims to be looking at multiple solutions as well involving desalination micro irrigation and groundwater recharge but india as a whole presents a very very challenging case mainly because in india water is a state issue so while the national government can say anything about the national desalination mission for example each state has its own prerogative to design their water policy and to de design their water provision system so at different levels of governance there are different roles being fulfilled the central government or the national government is an advisory board while the state government is more affiliated to solution design and touching back to the previous slide as well because of the fact that a lot of this information isn't in public domain while they say that exploration of alternative solutions is on hand and they've explored stuff like infrastructure and investment in demand management technologies we don't know how that's turned out we don't know what exactly they've done nor do we know what are the results of these studies taken up so this ends up feeding into each other as an lack of information loop and it's a very difficult way to get out of it until either all of these are in public domain first or it's much more explicitly given out and finally this is not as much as a point but a suggestion if a central governing agency has worked for multiple other countries would it could it work for us as well could it work for india now this is a cost curve which is india's projected base case supply demand gap what that means is that it is essentially shows in 2030 different interventions that can provide a particular amount of water and what are the costs attached to it so the x axis shows the incremental availability of different interventions and the y axis shows the costs the thing we need to focus on here is that water security essentially has three broad answers uh water conservation reuse and recycling and finally supply expansion and the most evident thing from this graph is that all the initiatives on the left which are related to agriculture are also related to water conservation and reuse and recycling of water and they seem to be the most cost efficient ways to try to deal with our water problem and when you move when you start moving towards the right of it you see all the blue bars are supply expansion they are obviously much more expensive forms to deal with your water problem but desalination is in specific is one of the most expensive alternatives out there this is obviously a generalization because different states might need desalination depending on whether their water is stressed or water is scarce but it really does beg the question is desalination even worth the cost furthermore it says what have we done with our feasibility studies how are they complete we need to know more about it thirdly we need efficient pricing strategies to ensure that demand management is secure and if a centralized water authority has worked for other people should we try to adopt it or is our system of having a state wise policy uh trying to push more towards a decentralized system which has also worked in multiple different countries 
So these are a few of the questions that we need to look at. And finally, for my takeaways, I want to use a framework that Professor Romney has introduced to me called the site framework. The idea is the fact that science, innovation, and technologies are looked at the saving graces to design any solution. And while this might be true, without the main option of engagement and without engaging multiple stakeholders to move towards a shared vision and ensure collaboration between different stakeholders, these solutions aren't going to be adopted. So my main takeaways for, for the science section, in-depth feasibility studies are required to evaluate the value of desalination. Innovation, we need to start trying to incentivize and introduce novelties into our problems. Technology, we need to look for different technological solutions and we need to look at which one is the most suited for our particular case. And finally, we need to try to engage with all stakeholders at different levels of governance or not to try to coordinate them to deal with the problem of water security and build a shared vision on the solution design. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for an excellent presentation. Okay, it was really good. Um, I would, we have again, five minutes. Uh, we have people from different countries here. I wondered if uh, anybody would like to comment uh, on another developing country, our friends from Nigeria or from MENA. Uh, is there anyone here? Please speak up, unmute and speak up. Otherwise, I'll put my question to uh, Jay. I think we have a very shy audience. What is this? <laughs> so the thing is, um, from what you said, uh, Jairaj, you see already India is at the top of the emerging countries in terms of scientific and technological capabilities. Okay, so all these um, examples that you found in UAE, Australia, Israel, they're all from uh, highly developed countries in terms of, uh, you know, resources. Uh, yeah. UAE, you know, and so do you think, did you find while you were doing your research, what, what was the general message to developing countries? Was it, did you find any opinions or, or what is your opinion? Uh, I remember reading essentially it's rather than trying to invest in one particular initiative, it is play the long game and try to set up an integrated water resource management system. Because once the system is in place, then you can look at investing into supply expansion or any other initiatives, any specific initiatives. But overall, if the system doesn't really incentivize or the system doesn't really help any other stakeholders to try to solve the problem, then whoever's going to try and maybe fail isn't going to try again. Yes. So setting up a proper, like trying to implement systemic change, which is the most difficult type of change to implement, right? especially for India, because some aspects are centralized, some aspects are decentralized, and it's one of the most diverse countries out there as well. But overall, that is the consensus, trying to set up an integrated water management system and trying to improve water provision infrastructure. Those are the two main things that one can try to invest in uh, to make sure that what we're, the resources that we already have aren't wasted. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And now we are going to enter into the dynamics even more. But before that, I want, again, you know, I am doing these little things in Zoom. Please take off your specs for those who are be spectacle oh, like before, me. Before you go on, there's a question on the chat, which is, is there an impact on the environment due to desalination? Go ahead. So there is a major impact on, on the environment. So desal has one side, side effect. If, we must say that, uh, which is the salt concentrate that comes out, which is brine. Uh, we don't know how to deal with that yet. I don't think there, there hasn't been any technologies to actually deal with that yet. So most of the countries that are providing for desalination are just dumping that brine back into the water. Now, as desalination gets adopted more and more frequently, that is obviously going to be a major problem. And it's going to completely impact the ecology of the ocean at that point in time. Uh, so yeah, there is a major environmental impact due to desalination and that technology also needs to be looked at in conjunction with desal technology. 